All right. Boom. All right. I think I'm live. And <laughs> boy, what a week has been. These Wendy's cups are great for um for holding water. Tell me if the audio is good. Uh <laughs> Yeah. Let's see here now. Yeah, everything's good, right? Audios, everything's fine. Um, I'm not using my usual setup. I'm actually using OBS on my Mac. So, you know, it's kind of like, I hope it works well. And um, anyway, we're not going to banter too much because then I'm going to get comments from a certain ham up in, I guess, Massachusetts, Cape Cod area. He's going to be like, well, your show sucks because you're rambling on like ham radio now. <laughs> I like ham radio now. I like Gary and, and those guys, you know, um, and we're good friends. So don't worry about that. And I interviewed Bert too. So anyway, welcome to Life with Rhea. Welcome, 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 welcome. And um, let's see. Uh, da, da. Yeah, you know, um, and then let me see my existing sources here. So I actually got the comments back kind of... Um, you know, kind of interesting here, and um, I want to see if it works, actually, uh, but anyway, it's kind of hokey, but um, yeah, you know, um, what can I say, it is, um, it is what it is, and um, let me see here, gosh, trash can comments, okay, anyway, uh, let's see. So my regular camera is actually, it's in the shop because of this SD card issue. And it kind of like sucks because then I have to, I, I got another camera on the way. It's just FedEx is giving me total heartburn about it. So I'm kind of like, you know, I just don't want to deal with it. But um, I'm going to see here normal oh I hate this thing you're not seeing what I'm seeing here like look at this okay like where it says I have a highlighted comment from T-Ray and it goes like total like he's a ghost you know um, so yeah it's this thing and you know the funny thing is I introduced this to the whole um, ham radio YouTube scene and they've been kind of like using it and um, everybody has it working properly except me. I actually have it working um, properly on my ATEM on um, the, um, what you call it, uh, the, the, the normal streaming switcher I use. But anyway, all right, I won't worry about that too much. So, um, anyway, all right, so let's go on. Um, I'm on Mac OS, you know, I'm not on Windows. Um, uh, FedEx, yep. You know, FedEx is so dumb. Uh, here I go, I'm going to get the comments from Bert. Um, FedEx is so dumb. They, um, they actually, uh, took my package. And then Friday they said operational delays. I waited on Saturday for the FedEx truck at home. I was sick too. And then, um, literally I got a text message saying how package delayed. And they tried to say that how it was me. Not, um, you know, not. hi, Russ. Thank you very much. And Russ, I'm going to highlight you. Woohoo. Nice. Thank you for the super chat. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, so I just put it to hold at, at one of the Walgreens locations and we're going to, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if anybody has any suggestions to make this work properly. I'd appreciate it. So anyway, let's get on to the meat of things here. See, it shows up against this black background better. Okay. Okie dokie. So where, when we la last left off, we were talking about, um, we did the G3, general three amateur rated practices, five exam questions, five groups. And we're, we, well, we're going into G4 now. Okay. So G4, um, station operation and setup. And this is one of my favorite ones because I like practical station operation stuff. So, um, I really like, you know, setting up stations and building stations and such like that. So, all right. Um, 
And of course, if you are learning from this, stop me if you have any questions, okay? Uh, what is So what is the purpose of the notch filter found on many HF transceivers? The answer is B, to, to reduce car interference from carriers in the receiver passband. So this is for those, um, the like, you know, somebody decides to basically, and you know, you saw a lot of this during the 3Y0, uh, 3Y0J de-expedition to Bouvet Island, where these people are dropping carriers, and you basically had to just basically drop a notch filter. So what the notch filter does is literally like a notch. Like, you know, you have a piece of wood, and you need to cut out a piece of it. You notch it out, right, with a knife or something. So this one, you notch it out with your notch filter. Uh, what is one advantage of selecting opposite or reverse sideband when receiving CW signals on a typical HF transceiver? And the answer is C, it may be possible to reduce or eliminate from other signals. So the way CW Morse code works is that the transmitter transmits a carrier signal. And then you at the receiver have a circuit called a beat frequency oscillator or BFO. And what that does is that mixes with the carrier signal inside your receiver, of course, and it produces a tone, which is the sum or the difference of the, of the carrier signal and your BFO. Now, if you have your, um, if you have a, a strong signal on the upper side and, you know, right adjacent to the CW signal, and you put your BFO, you might not be able to receive that signal properly. So you can then shift to the lower side where you get away from that strong interfering signal. And you could also use a notch filter to notch them out too. And this way you get, um, you, you could reduce or eliminate the interference from the other signal. Very handy feature. What is normally meant by operating a transceiver in split mode? All right. By the way, for this first one, G4A02, the second question, uh, you can watch my video on where I talk about sidebands. There, there is some applicable theory there. So G4A03, what is normally meant by operating a transceiver in split mode? Well, see, the transceiver is set to different transmit receive frequencies. Um, so auto notch filter, actually, um, in some transceivers, it's good because some transceivers will intelligently figure out what is a carrier and what is a CW signal. So, um, but yeah, but generally manual notch filters work better, you know? Generally manual notch filters work better on, um, so Metal Halo is asking, auto notch filter not good on CW? So um, it could work depending on transceiver. Some transceivers it works, some transceivers it doesn't work, but generally it could be hit or miss, but some transceivers are smart enough to actually get the auto notch filter onto a continuous interfering carrier rather than um, this, the desired signal. Okay, so yeah, so we talk about split phone um, and the answer is C. So a lot of people in Bouvet, the expedition, like who are working the Bouvet, the expedition could have learned what split mode means. And split mode basically means that you listen on one frequency and you transmit on another. This weekend I worked a couple stations, the Bouvet, um, not Bouvet, the St. Brandon, island and they i worked them on split on ssb on voice mode and also on um on um on ft8 which i didn't work on split and also on um on cw okay all right uh g4a04 what is a re what reading on the plate current meter of a vacuum tube rf power amplifier indicates correct adjustment of the plate tuning control. B, a pronounced dip. So generally, what this means is that the power is being transferred properly to your load, which is your antenna. So that's why you have the pronounced dip. So you have the dip, right? And then generally you hear old time was about talking about um, dip the plate. So you basically tune the transceiver until you see a dip. Okay, uh, what is the reason to use an automatic level control with an RF power amplifier? The answer is C, to reduce distortion due to excess drive. So how ALC works is that ALC actually will, um, the transceiver will produce 
a voltage that will reduce, sorry, not the transceiver, the amplifier will produce a voltage that will reduce the, the, the transmitter power um, output so if it detects overdriving. So for example, if you're overdriving, the amplifier will produce voltage to reduce it from the transceiver. Some transceivers really don't use ALC all that well, like the flex radio, I don't use it at all. I actually use um, Ethernet control with my flex and PGXL anyway. Uh, G4A06, what type of device is often used to mass transmitter output impedance to an impedance not equal to 50 ohms? The answer is C, antenna coupler or antenna tuner. So the antenna tuner basically, it basically matches the impedance of one of your antenna to the transceiver. What condition can lead to permanent damage to a solid state RF power amplifier? The answer is D excessive drive power so the rest of these here are kind of like you know they're they're things that not are going to are not going to um damage you short the input to ground no that ain't going to work that ain't going to do anything yeah low input swr no that's actually good um insufficient drive power that's probably good too excessive drive power pushes the trans power transistors beyond their limits and it could lead them into this condition called thermal runaway which is where they will heat up and some of them might violently explode actually i've had i've seen transistors explode g4a08 what is the correct adjustment for the load or coupling control of a vacuum tube rf power amplifier the answer is d maximum power output without exceeding maximum allowable plate current so in an amplifier like an al811 which is the world's most popular power amplifier the ameritron ala11 you adjust the um, the the power output, and you try not to exceed the maximum plate current. Yes, it leads to magic smoke. You release the magic smoke. That's correct. Um, how was Houston Ham Fest, by the way? You guys were there, right? I wish I could have gone. G four A zero nine. Why is a time delay sometimes included in transmitter keying circuit? The answer is C, to allow for a transmit receive changeover operations to complete properly before RF output is allowed. And this is especially true where in VHF and UHF, where you have a bunch of um, uh, you know, preamplifiers and a lot of switching has to be done. And you basically have a device called a sequencer. So the sequencer will then switch you know, from transmit to receive and then, or switch from receive to transmit before the transceiver actually applies power. Some of you have a preamplifier, you have a um, transverter, you have antenna switching, all sorts of Rube Goldberg stuff needs to happen before you could apply power. And you want to make sure that you're not applying power into a receiver, you know. Oh, you got screwed by Joe. Ah, I heard Joe was having a good time, you know. Yeah, so that's good. Okay. Uh, let's see here. All right. Yeah. Um, to complete properly for our output slot. Okay. What's the purpose of an electronic keyer? The answer is B, automation, uh, automatic generations of strings of dots and dashes for a CW operation, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, a keyer can be either you have a, um, you can have a conventional keyer, which uses a set, use a, a paddle, right? A single paddle or a set of dual paddle, dual level paddles, where you'll generate a dit or a da, right? Depending on which side you turn. Um, or you have a memory keyer, and a memory keyer could generate messages. And a lot of radios today have both of them built in. So you attach a CW paddles, and you could do dit da, dit da, 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 dit da, 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 you know? That kind of stuff or you can put complete messages and um, you know you can definitely um, um, like send out things so he, it, listen cheat cheat when I DX okay I'm not behind my paddle sending my call sign every single time no what I do is I actually um, I have my stuff in a memories in my flex radio even when I'm on my iPhone okay my iPhone's on discord right now 
But um, even on my iPhone, I have the the um, CW macros for N2RJ599. Thank you, CQCQ. And I work CW that way, okay? Some people think it's cheating, but you know what? It's technology, man. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, let's see here. It was awesome meeting him. I will cherish it. Yes. Yes, Joe's a great guy. Fun fact about Joe, uh, a couple of years ago for Hammer University, Joe Joe was one of the few ham radio operators that actually visited the shack of N2RJ. So he was at my house. He stayed there. Good guy. Probably have him back sometime. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Joe. Nice. Uh, which of the following is a use for IF shift control on a receiver? The answer is A, to avoid interference from stations very close to the receive frequency. All right. Okay. C, which of the following is a common use for a dual VFO feature in a transceiver? C, to permit monitoring of two different frequencies. And this is useful for a number of reasons, especially when you're DXing. So when you're DXing, you listen to the the station, right? Yes, DD radio, iambic and non-iambic, correctly, correct. Yeah. Hey, Cola. So Cola is your your friendly moderator, okay? Well, one of we have several of them. Um, but um, yeah. So uh, the dual VFO feature on a transceiver, especially, is useful for DXing. You can listen to the DX and you can listen to the pileup. And when you listen to the DX, you're listening there, and then you listen to the pileup to hear where they're answering 599, you call them there, you know. That, that's my big secret to work in so much DX, okay. Um, yeah, Joe, I remember you. And then, um, you know, I hear them say 599, and then I go up right where they are, and I send my call sign, you know. Hey, K4AYL, thank you, Juan Luis Valentin. Okay, very nice, thank you. Okay, hello from Miami, Florida. And you want to know something? I broadcast on Radio Miami International, WRMI. Great radio station, but they're in Okeechobee. Okay, to permit monitoring two different frequencies. Okay, uh, G4A13, what is one reason to use the attenuator function as present on many HF transceivers? The answer is A, to reduce signal overload due to strong incoming signals, especially during a contest where you have a lot of stations in Europe that are using legal power, right? They're using a lot of power. They produce a lot of strong signals and um, <laughs> you're trying to, to, you know, to receive s signals and it's overloading your receiver. You basically turn it down, you know. So um, yeah, you turn it down, and then um, you'll be able to hear some of the the weaker signals. Believe it or not, by turning down the gain. Another reason is you reduce the noise. So you turn down the RF gain, or use the attenuator to reduce the noise, and you get signal. This is, by the way why a lot of us who work the low bands use beverage antennas because they're very low noise antennas. They reduce signal but they also reduce noise and they reduce the noise to a greater amount than they reduce the signals. Okay. Hmm. Joe. Joe. Okay. All right. What is likely to happen for transceivers? ALC. <laughs> yeah. When it will run 25 kilowatts. <laughs> it's funny. Okay. Uh, what is like to happen with transceivers? ALC. Somebody's messaging here. Okay. Right. Uh, what is like to happen with transceivers? ALC systems not set properly in receiving AFK SK signals using single sideband mode. Um, so, um, the answer is improper action of ALC distorts the signal and you can cause spurious emissions. So, um, AFSK, by the way, stands for audio frequency shift keying, which means basically you inject audio tones into the transceiver and, um, 
it actually um, will then, you know, basically produce frequency shift keying signals, tones like um, like what you hear on FT8, right? That's an example of audio frequency shift keying. Um, normally, on something like RTTY, you would have genuine frequency shift keying, which is where the computer will send signals over a serial port and tell the transceiver to generate these tones at different frequencies. Whereas an audio frequency shift keying, you're sending this as audio and then their, tra their transmitter is processing it as audio and is still generating the tones as audio. But the thing is, if the ALC system is not set properly, you can have distortion because you're overdriving and then what happens when you're overdriving, you splatter and then that causes spurious emissions, which are bad because you interfere with other people. Poor practice, poor engineering practice, they may also violate FCC rules. Um, you know, the FCC is probably not going to go knocking on your door, but they, you might get uh, the stink eye, you know, so, okay. Which of the following can be a symptom of transmitted RF being picked up by an audio cable carrying AFSK? The answer is all of the above. The box circuit does not unkey the transmitter because it basically forms a giant feedback loop, okay? And then um, the transmitter signal is distorted, yes, because you're adding additional signal in there. Frequent connection timeouts, because you are going, um, causing errors in the computer. Yes, data errors, definitely. So, um, and then um, you have, of course, um, you know, that's the answer. All, all these choices are correct. So this is one of my favorites, G4A16. How does a noise blanker work? So a noise blanker works by C, reducing receiver gain during a noise pulse. So essentially what happens, and these, are, these noise blankers were designed essentially for pulse type noise. What is one type of pulse ty type noise that you normally hear about? Especially in mobile applications. Spark plugs. Right? So spark plugs cause um, pulse type noise because when the spark ignites, it goes on for an instant of a second and then it stops. And how this noise blanker works, it basically shuts off the receiver during that time. And, um, you know, for that very short fraction of a section, so, um, second. It works exceptionally well for that. When I used to operate regularly mobile, I would have it in my old Honda. I would have it like that. Um, and then um, also electric fences. Those of you who live in rural areas like I do and you have electric fences nearby, sometimes they arc and they, you hear them like they go tick, 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 you know, and then um, noise blankers could take them out. Okay. G4A17. What happens as the noise reduction control level in a receiver is increased? The answer is A, receive signals become distorted. So noise reduction, of course, um, works best when the noise is below the signal, but when the noise and the signal are at similar levels, it becomes harder for noise reduction to pick out what is noise and what is signal. Um, some transceivers actually do a pretty exceptional job. The Anon transceivers with their software do a really great job at that. So, you know, but it's, you still lose something. All right, G4B, test monitoring equipment, two-tone test. Let's go G4B01. What item of test equipment contains horizontal and vertical channel amplifiers? Well, 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 you know, my friend Alan Wolka, W2AEW, might, um, you know, uh, he will tell you a lot about this because he's the oscilloscope guru. He works with Tektronix. So the oscilloscope, yes, has the horizontal and the vertical, okay? Yeah, and one of them is the time base and one is the amplitude. So um, let's see here. At least a spark plug. Yeah, you know, but Tesla has other problems, you know. Um, I don't have mine right now. I'm getting back this week. It went into Tesla for something. Okay. Uh, G4B02, which of the following is an advantage of an oscilloscope versus a digital voltmeter? 
you can um, complex waveforms can be measured yes so the oscilloscope actually you know one interesting thing I've been doing with an oscilloscope is that um so in my work for EcoFlow I've been helping them measure different um, the inrush current of various appliances for you know to tweak the uh, trip current in their home um, smart home panel and one of the things I've been doing is I've been going I've been going to other people's houses too and sticking a current probe inside their circuit box and their, their main panel with the um, the clamp on one of the circuits and then uh, we start we set a trigger we start up the load bam and then you can see the inrush current and then where it dies down so that's one example you can measure things like sine waves as well too you know for RF measure square waves sawtooth etc uh, let's see noise blanker reduces noise across a wide range of frequencies the noise blanker operates within the pass band so it essentially operates within that small receiver slice um, and um, it does not really operate in the um, you know across a wide range of frequencies now the um, how should I put the uh, the flex radios have something called a wideband noise blanker right and all WNB and um, WNB is a kind of a eh, it's kind of a, a you know a, a wide version of the noise blanker right and um, whoops it um, you know it will basically um, remove noise over a wide pass band okay okay all right next one is which of the following is best instrument for use when checking the key and waveform of a CW transmitter of course, an oscilloscope, you're checking a complex waveform, right? Sine wave. What signal source is connected to the vertical input of an oscilloscope when checking the RF envelope pattern of the transmitting signal? D, the attenuated RF output of the transmitter. Now, I'm not bagging on some other YouTubers, but I've seen some people use an attenuator, a big resistor, to... Um, to measure things with a spectrum analyzer and oscilloscope you could use that but the preferred method really is to use something called a directional coupler which basically it just taps off a small sample and then it sends the rest of it out and you could put that into a dummy load this way you get something that doesn't really load down the transmitter as such what it will do is you know you get a very small tap off a sample and then the rest of it goes through as usual. So um, I have one made by Precise RF, and um, uh, you can you know um, you can use that to uh, get a signal into your oscilloscope or spectrum analyzer. All right, D uh, G four B zero five. Why is a high input impedance desirable for a voltmeter? And I just spoke about this. D it increases the loading on circuits. It decreases the loading on circuits being measured so high input impedance basically means that it basically has a shows a very high resistance to um, the uh, to the source and you don't have a lot of loading so if for example you have a load of like a hundred ohms and then you put that on say a battery you're drawing or, or an RF transmitter you're drawing a significant amount whereas if you put something that's an infinite impedance you're not drawing any current so it's not affected by the, the test instrument right uh, you could think of it in practical terms like let's say you're let's say you're measuring a car's um, output with a dynamometer right uh, the dynamometer you know you strap that on well you have that and then you, you have the wheels rolling if the dynamometer has a lot of friction inside of it you'll find that it will not give you an accurate measurement but if it has relatively free rolling you know it's going to give you a more accurate measurement because 
the power is being measured, it's not being bogged down by internal friction, internal losses. What's an advantage of a digital voltmeter as compared to an analog voltmeter? The answer is C, precision, better precision, because you can get digits re read out rather than an analog meter. Analog meters are actually better for a lot of things, so they're better for measuring trends, like for example, a capacitor charging, you can see it going up, right, or discharging, or changes in circuits, so you can actually see it better that way. What signals are used to conduct a two-tone test? We want two non-harmonically related audio signals. And um, the League and, you know, the AWR Lab, right, they do a lot of two-tone testing and a lot of things when they're testing transceivers. Which of the following instruments may be used to monitor relative RF output when making antenna transmitter adjustments? The answer is A, a field strength meter. So field strength meter measures relative RF output. Which of the following can be determined with a field strength meter? B, the radiation pattern of an antenna. So you basically go around the antenna and you measure the um, field strength. Which of the following can be determined with a directional watt meter? SWR, standing wave ratio. So you measure the forward power and you measure the reverse. Now those of you who are like me who have bird watt meters, you get the slug and you have the slug has a forward direction and a reverse direction. So you could turn the slug around, you measure forward and reverse power. Which of the following must be connected to an antenna analyzer when it's been used for SWR measurements? Um, antenna and feed line. So you have to be connect, you have to connect the antenna to the analyzer. As strange as it sounds, Right, um, I have a couple. I have a couple ones. Rig expert, and I have some MFTA ones too. What problem can occur when making measurements on an antenna system with an antenna analyzer? Strong signals from nearby transmitters can affect the accuracy of measurements because that RF is feeding in. What is used for an antenna analyzer other than measuring the SWR of an antenna system? The answer is determining the impedance of a coaxial cable. Now, something you have to know is that even the cheap MFJ antenna analyzers have this feature. And there's a video by Martin Jew where he shows you how to calculate the, co the length of a piece of coax using the MFJ analyzer. You have to do a lot of turning and some calculations, but you can do it. What's an instance in which use of an instrument with an analog readout may be preferred over an instrument with a digital readout? The answer is D, when adjusting tuned circuits, because you're looking for that dip, as before. What type of transmitter performance does a two-tone test analyze? The answer is um, linearity. So you're looking for, you know, a linear circuit, right? Okay. Uh, G4C, let's see, interference to consumer electronics, grounding, digital signal processing. Which of the following might be useful in reducing RF interference to audio frequency devices? B, bypass capacitors. Right. Yeah, the bird meters are great, Brian, I'll tell you. I really, you know, I like the bird 43, which I have one of. They're really nice. Uh, which will be following, so bypass capacitor. Which of the following could be a cause of interference covering a wide range of frequencies? C, arcing at a poor electrical connection. Yes, typically on a utility pole, a transformer, you know, or similar. And in that case, don't touch it. You call your utility and you tell them to fix it. Um, yeah. Uh, the one thing that I tell you about, um, about this, though, is that you could buy these little like um, instruments that'll use like a dish, ultrasonic dish to find the instruments, but stay far away from the power poles because even touching the pole itself, you will, um, you will, you could probably electrocute yourself. But the power companies have a, um, uh, a vested interest in, um, in, you know, reducing RF interference for several reasons. One of them is they don't want the wrath of the FCC 
because the FCC does come down on power companies for interference. One. The other thing is that when they're arcing, they're wasting electricity and electricity costs them money. And the other thing is they're damaging equipment. So, you know, it's better they don't do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, DC, nice to see you. Uh, I hope you pass your exam. Uh, G4C03, what sound is heard from an audio device or telephone if there's interference from a nearby single sideband phone transmitter? Distorted speech, and you might hear like, you'll hear like a quack quack like Donald Duck sort of, well, a really distorted Donald Duck. What is the effect on an audio device when there is interference from a nearby CW transmitter? On and off humming or clicking. So you'll hear something like, da, 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 da. you see, something like that. G4C05, what might be the problem if you receive an RF burn mm, when touching your equipment while transmitting on an HF band, assuming the equipment is connected to a ground rod? The ground wire has a high impedance on that frequency. So that means that the current is not being diverted to ground. It's going to the chassis and you'll have hot microphone. You know, so um, uh, old rusted metal con connections can amplify. Yes, because they act as a diode, believe it or not. Right. Yeah. What effect can be caused by a resonant ground connection? The answer is um, high RF voltages on the enclosures of station equipment. Right. So the ground connection will act as an antenna, so to speak. Uh, why should solder joints not be used with wires that connect the base of a tower system to ground rods? The answer is a solder joint will likely be destroyed by the heat of a lightning strike. That's very important. So for lightning protection, you don't use solder. What you want to use is you want to use either the screw-on connections, right? Or, and this is what you use in professional, you know, insulations, um, commercial electrical, you use exothermic welding, commonly known as CAD welding, where you basically have your ground rods, you have the wire, and you have a little ceramic um, pot, and you have the shot in there, light it on fire, it will make some nice fire, and then when it's done, you have a very solid exothermically welded connection, and this will work well with lightning protection. Uh, which of the following will reduce RF interference caused by common mode current on an audio cable? So common mode means that it's on the outside of the cable. So um, you place a ferrite choke around the cable and that'll basically break it up. How can a ground loop be avoided? D, connect all ground connectors to a single point. And I should add a very low resistance, you know, low impedance connection to ground. You want something that is solid and, um, you know, if, if you have any difference in potential, you can have a ground loop. What could be a symptom of a ground loop somewhere in your station? A, you receive reports of hum in your station's transmitted signal. What technique helps minimize RF hotspots in an amateur station? You bond all the equipment enclosures together. Um... And bonding all your grounds and all your service grounds is actually good practice. It's also good um, compliance with the National Electric Code. You want to bond everything to your service ground as well. And that's in Article 250. Uh, which of the following is an, an advantage of a receiver DSP IF filter as compared to an analog filter? You have a wider range of filter bandwidths and shapes that you can create. Uh, yes, solder actually melts very easily. That's true. Metal halo. Yeah, Russ, you know, I also did my three exams in one sitting. All right. Uh, so, yeah, so with the IF DSP IF filter, you're not, you don't have to buy like crystals. So in the old days, you had to buy crystals for each filter. You had to buy individual filter units. You know, you buy them from ICOM or Kenwood or... Um, in rad used to make them and then you put them inside the the radio you solder them in or you plug them in 
and you'd only have a few bandwidths available of filters. But now you have DSP, you can adjust to your heart's content. Why must the metal enclosure of every item of station equipment be grounded? D, it ensures that hazardous voltage cannot appear in the chassis. And this is important because the ground is usually in your service box, in your, you know, your home electrical panel is bonded to the ground. Um, the ground is bonded to the neutral. And what happens is that if you have, let's say, the, the hot wire, um, you know, one of the, the input become loose and it shorts to the ground, well, it will trip your circuit breaker, which is good. and It'll shut off the power. Um, if one of the high voltage um, components inside, say, like a power amplifier, becomes loose and touches the chassis, it'll be shorted to ground and it will shut off too. It will also trip the circuit breaker. You know? Yeah. Uh, T-Ray, you know what, T-Ray? I'm going to be doing an extra one, okay? I definitely want to help you get your extra. I need you to get your extra because you deserve your extra. Um, speech processors and S meter sideband operations near band edges. This is very important, not only for the exam, but also for practical operating that you must know where you're operating and how to avoid trouble. Okay. Okay. I even wrote about this in my technician book too. What's the purpose of a speech processor is used in a more, in a modern transceiver? A, to increase the intelligibility of transmitted phone signals during poor conditions. In other words, it allows you to punch through the noise. That's a, they, they use all of these big, you know, long sentence to say that you're punching through the noise, okay? <laughs> right. Increase the intelligibility of transmitted phone signals during poor conditions. B.S. You needed to punch through that noise. Mm, okay. <laughs> Which of the following describes how a speech processor affects a transmitted single sideband phone signal? B, it increases the average power. So, as an audio person as well, so I do audio. I do audio and video for worship, right? Um, and we use a speech processor because sometimes you might have somebody doing the readings and they're quiet as a mouse. And you know, they're quiet as a mouse. Then you have the choir, you know, and the singers. They're singing and they're belting it out. So, you kind of have to average them out, right? You have a limiter for them too. We also have compression. Make it sound heavily. You make a joyful noise. So it increases the average power, right? Because it makes everything even, Steven. Which of the following can be the result of an incorrectly adjusted speech processor? You can have distorted speech. You can have splatter. You can have excessive background pickup. You're picking up the fans and the, the noise in the room. You hear that on 75 meters, right? And of course, all these choices are correct. What does an S meter measure receive signal strength, right? Yes. Uh, trivia, by the way, um, S9 is minus 73 dBm decibels per millivolt of signal strength. Okay. All right. Uh, how does a signal that reads 20 dB over 9 compare to to one that reads S9, assuming a properly properly calibrated S meters. So is a hundred times more powerful. Uh, where is an S meter found? The answer is A in the receiver, not in the transmitter. How much must the power output of a transmitter be raised to change the S meter reading on a distant receiver from S8 to S9? approximately four times so you know remember that every s unit is approximately um, 6 db right but remember what we learned about db each 3 db is twice the power or twice the signal so if you have 6 db you have four times the signal yes 
What frequency range is occupied by 3 kHz lower sideband signal when the displayed carrier frequency is set to 7178? Yes, and this is important. Lower sideband, the answer is C7175 to 7178. So this goes, a, a lot of people need to learn this. Just because your privileges say you can operate from 7175 to 7300, doesn't mean you can go, you can set your transceiver's dial to 7175, lower sideband, and then start transmitting. Because what's going to happen is, you start at 7175 and you transmit 3 kilohertz lower sideband down. And then you'll be out of band. I made this mistake once. Once. I got a pink card from an official observer way back when. It was in the heat of a contest. What frequency range is occupied by a 3 kilohertz upper sideband signal with the displayed carrier frequency set to 14347? And the answer is 14347 to 14350. So you start at 14347 and you go up. How close to the lower band, lower edge of the phone segment should your displayed carrier B frequency be when using 3 kilohertz wide lower sideband? Um, so, you know, they say at least 3 kilohertz, right? This way, some radios actually automatically um, adjust it, like the flex radios actually automatically keep you within band. That's a very cool feature. How close to the upper edge of the phone segment should your displayed carrier frequency be when using 3 kHz wide upper sideband? The answer is at least 3 kHz below the edge of the band. So it's safe to say, you know, to keep 3 kHz below. Let's talk about mobile. Um, so a really, really good site, and I'll put this in the chat here, uh, for mobile operation is k0bg.com. Alan Applegate is the guru of mobile operation. He knows everything about mobile operation. He has a lot of great tips. Uh, what's the purpose of a capacity hat, capacitance hat on a mobile antenna to electrically lengthen a physically short antenna? So yeah, so you know, you add the capacitance hat on the top and it will increase the length electrically. What's the purpose of a corona ball on an HF mobile antenna? To reduce RF voltage discharge from the tip of the antenna while transmitting. So yeah, that ball will reduce the voltage discharge. The funny thing is that I see these CBers in these um you know these key downs that you see on YouTube. Um and these guys are transmitting they have their their big strappers on the CB, you know, stuff inside their uh, old Chevy Suburban or Expedition with a V8 engine <laughs> and, and then they have Dave made or um, striker amplifiers in the back and they're um, they're transmitting and you see sparks flying from the antenna <laughs> that's nuts <laughs> okay but anyway uh, which of the following direct fuse power connections would be best for a hundred watt HF mobile installation um, to the battery using heavy gauge wire so it's good to be, you must have low resistance wire. Um, so, you know, you don't want to have voltage drop. So you have wire that's sufficient gauge that could carry the required current. And then um, you have a fuse right at the battery because if you get in a, in a crash, what's going to happen is the battery might fly loose or something might short circuit. And then what's going to happen is that a short circuit will light a fire and that's worse you know it puts you and and your um <laughs> your first the first responders the police the firefighters the ems and all the rescue workers you're going to put them in danger too it says as a kid it thought was to keep you from poking your eye out <laughs> isn't that was it daisy um was it red riders for you know you know i went to walmart to buy one they they didn't have them in stock. I ended up walking out with another air rifle. Right, so the battery using. You don't connect to the alternator because the alternator, um, well, the, the first of all, the alternator is hard to get to. Secondly, the alternator's out power output might be a little rough, so it's better to get it from the battery. And then the alternator generally is not connected while the engine is not running. 
Okay. Uh, why is it best to not draw the DC power for a 100 watt HF transceiver from a vehicle's auxiliary power socket? So this is a cigarette lighter socket, right? The answer is B, the socket's wiring may be inadequate for the current drawn by the transceiver. And this is, this is important. Most of these sockets have very thin gauge wire. The circuit's only 10 to 15 amps. And um, you put an HF transceiver there, you're drawing easily 20 to 25 amps. Bam. Which of the following most limits an HF mobile installation? C, efficiency of electrically short antenna. Right? The battery is like a huge capacitor. You know, when I did car audio, um, we'd also use big capacitors too. And I was big into car audio back in Trinidad. Uh, what's the disadvantage of using a short mobile antenna as opposed to a full size antenna? Operating bandwidth is going to be very limited. Right? So if you have a capacity hat, you know. You're going to have to be tuning that that bad boy every time you move around. But if you have an antenna that's long enough, it's gonna you're not going to have to do that. Okay. Um, oh, AV. <laughs> well, you know what? You have the license now, and that's all that counts. Here's the funny thing. If you, if you let your license lapse, you'll have to take the technician test and pass it to get back your extra. And once you pass the technician, you could get back your extra right away. Okay. Which of the following may cause receive interference in a radio installed in a vehicle? The answer is the battery charging system, the alternator. You hear that alternator whine. The fuel delivery system, fuel pump, right? Fuel pumps do cause interference. Vehicle control computer. Yeah, and these, you know, the ECUs in a lot of these cars produce a lot of interference. So all these choices are correct. All right. Uh, yes, you get to know your, your wire gauge. You know, it's in the National Electric Code, but um, they follow it. I actually um, work on, on designing RV power systems, and, you know, we follow that as well, too. What's the name of the process by which sunlight is changed directly to electricity? photovoltaic conversion. So you'll find like a lot of solar panels are referred to as PV. That stands for photovoltaic. What is the approximate open circuit voltage from a fully illuminated silicon photovoltaic cell? The answer is half a volt DC. Of course, that's the open circuit voltage. That's with no load. Once you apply load, it drops. What's the reason that a series diode is connected between a solar panel and a storage battery that's being charged by the panel? The, ba the diode prevents self-discharge of the battery during, through the panel during times of lower no illumination. So a solar panel, a solar cell essentially is a diode um, and you know current could flow back through the solar panel. You don't want to do that. Now um, I must say that this is kind of like a very simplistic example because these days most people are using charge controllers with their solar. So like, you know, you use either a PWM controller, pulse width modulation, which basically rapidly switches the solar panel off and on, or use a MPPT controller, maximum power power track point tracking, which is a DC to DC converter, but it has an intelligent algorithm which will apply the uh, you know a load to the panel to produce the maximum amount of power so it operated very efficiently what's the following uh, is a disadvantage of using wind as a primary source of power from an emergency station uh, a large energy storage system is needed to supply power when the wind is not blowing in other words you're going to need a, you're going to need a lot of batteries okay <laughs> Yeah, so that's essentially what they're saying. All right. Uh, although these days batteries are getting cheap. Wind is very intermittent. Um, solar generally gives you the best bang for buck. All right. Uh, I think I'll continue G5 probably tomorrow or Tuesday. I have to see which one. But um, this is very good. So, you know what? I'm... I hope I've been helpful, but I'm going to be continuing till the bitter end, and then we're going to try for extra 
too. I know T Ray wants to get his extra, and um, everybody else who's studying for extra. But if you're studying for general, um, if you have anything in particular, you can. Yes, a diode is like a check valve, T Ray. Uh, if you have any questions at all, Ria at n2rj.com. Um, you can email me. Uh, you can also um, catch me on social media. Um, Twitter, I'm on Twitter at Ria Jarum, right? And um, you can leave stuff in the comments. I will talk about it too. So I like the, the, the comments. You guys can talk about it as well too. Okay. Thank you, Russ. We love all of you too. You guys are awesome. Um, and I wouldn't do this without you. You know, you guys are, you guys are great. Um, let's see what else. So we talk about the electrical position. Um, principles here you have impedance reactance etc etc so we're going to continue this i'm going to try to continue this tomorrow i'm going to figure out a time slot to do this and um i think this trips up a lot of people right we're going to do some calculations as well too and uh so on t way hey hey that's a good one you know um cola will like that one 3845 very nice very nice t-ray um, although, you know, I'm, these days I'm, you know, I've, I used to carry a 45. I don't carry a 45 anymore. I carry a nine now, you know, so, um, but you know, that's, that's nice. Uh, let's see here now. Let me see if I can get these comments up. We just had a browser source and, um, oh my gosh. Uh, hmm. Oh, well. All right. Um, oh, yeah. Here we are. I got it now. I'm going to experiment with this thing here. There we go. And let's see here. Does that work? Um, math live on YouTube. Oh, you do. Okay. Hmm. 1911 nice i've been thinking of getting one um i have a i have a 22 um probably get uh one in 45 let's see here let's see if that works dun, dun. camera plus word there we go and let's see if this works now yes so, all right. Nice. Yeah, you see, I got you there now. Okay. All right. 73, everybody. Good night. I'll see you around. Peace in 73s. And let's do the bumper again.